You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. We have our uh, guest on, who's going to join us, uh, Marita Noon. Uh, she's got this great article that she just put out with townhall.com. Of course, she is an energy expert and a friend of the program. Marita, it's great to have you back with us. Uh, this is uh, Brett and John, and welcome to the final say. Well, thank you, Brett and John. It's a treat to be with you again. It's been too long. It, it has. So I'm looking, reading over your article, and of course you you had to put in references, didn't you? So of course I went and printed off the the report, the critical thinking, because I said, critical thinking, do they do that in Washington? So I printed <laughs> off that report. <laughs> I, I printed off the report, and I was scanning through it. I'll admit I haven't read the whole thing yet, but I'll, I'll get to it eventually. But very interesting, and I, I think the questions that you raised and that some of the senators raised are definitely worthy and should be answered. And that is, you know, when as the president goes out there and he makes his speeches and he, you know, talks about the increased temperatures around the globe and that they're rising faster than we predicted, you know, even 10 years ago and all, you know, all these very important, but possibly extreme statements that he's making. And then we find out that, well, he's not necessarily telling us the truth, is he? No, he's not. In fact, I titled the, uh, the title of my article is why is Obama lying on climate change, which I thought was, it's kind of making a bold statement there, but the, the facts bear that out. And even the Democrats on the panel at this hearing uh, couldn't agree. They couldn't support Obama's statement and, and, in fact, acknowledge that the temperature has not only not increased as rapidly as Obama said it was, but, in fact, it has, it has virtually you know, stopped, virtually non-existent. Yeah, if, if we can, because you... you... I, I really enjoyed your article here, and you, you gave two great examples of two senators who were questioning um, he- Heidi Cullen and, you know, point blank trying to get her to say the president wasn't being honest about that, was he? <laughs> I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> yes, and obviously I thought it was as well, which is why I put it in the article. And also let me mention that I'm glad that you downloaded that article or the, the report from the Senate, that was part of my hope in writing the column, is that people who read the column would would be prompted to get more information through that report, because I think the report is an extremely valuable uh, tool for people to have at their fingertips when, when uh, if they're engaged in discussions about climate change, it's good information that people need to be able to have. And it, it, the, the report does list a variety of claims and predictions that have been made in the last four decades about climate change and then um, shows where they're wrong. And the report includes President Obama's statement. But as you mentioned, a Senator Vitter uh, from Louisiana and Senator Sessions from Alabama, both of whom are Republican senators, both of them put the question out there uh, during their Q&A time, because the way the hearings work is the panelists have five minutes each to kind of give what they've been brought in to say, and on the panel were five people, the first panel, three of them were invited by the Democrats and were basically adhered to the alarmist viewpoint, and two were invited by the Republicans and basically adhered to the skeptic viewpoint. And after each of the panelists gave their five minutes' worth of content, then the senators in the hearing have a chance to ask questions. And if the bidder was first, because he's the, he's the minority member, the ranking member, and so he asked, you know, he read Obama's quote and then said, can any of you agree with that? And if you watch it, and there's a link in my column to the video of the hearing, it's, it's almost worth watching, except for you'd have to watch through about two hours before you get to this, to, to feel the awkwardness in the room as he asked, can any of you agree with this statement? And even the, the three alarmists that were brought in by the Democrats could not agree with that statement. And then there was a few other questions, and then it was Jeff, Senator Sessions' turn, and he repeated basically the same question and got basically uh, the same response, which was silence, because nobody could 
agree with that. And through that Q&A time, Heidi Cohen, the Democrat star witness, did acknowledge that not only has is the climate, the temperature, not accelerating rapidly, as President Obama said, but that it's actually the, the increase has actually um, it has slowed. Yeah, that, that's right. Now, I, ha- I have to laugh because I was, you know, we're friends on Facebook, and I was watching a couple things that you posted. I think it was towards the end of last week or maybe over the weekend. And, of course, you, you watch these hearings and, and probably many others as well. And I, I have to admit that if I'm bored and I'm flicking through the channels, I occasionally watch uh, some of these. Uh, dip, and it's not just energy. It could be any topic. I watch sure. these hearings, and I, I think it's actually fascinating, and I wish more people would do so because I think the average American would gain a better understanding of, how, one, how their government functions and what they're actually doing down there in Washington. But you gain some insight as to the different things that are being debated, the different types of experts, and what they're actually saying. And I, I think it's important because, you know, the average person lives off a soundbite in the media or just a one-line thing that they read in, in uh, you know, on the top of a newspaper. It could be just the headline. And, and then that's their knowledge on, oh, it's got to be global warming because they said so on the front page of the New York Times. And we're saying, no, you have to listen to the facts and evaluate decades of information to determine – is their claim really true? And in this case, it's just not. Yeah, and, and it is true. And I, I did watch the entire four-hour hearing. I uh, didn't intend to. I intended to just kind of skip through. I was looking for a few specific things. But but I did watch the whole thing. And I also talked to, on the phone, three people who were there. I talked to two of the witnesses. I talked to uh, Dr. Roy Spencer. And I talked to Diana Puget Ross who uh, was one of the economists that was invited. And then I talked to a gentleman who was there as an observer to kind of get, I wanted to get the, from him the local color, kind of what, what was the atmosphere in the room, what, what was it like. And uh, so I put a lot of work into it. But the reality is that very few people have time in their life to sit and watch a four-hour long hearing. And this mm-hmm. is just one hearing that's going on. There's hearings going on on Capitol Hill all the time, every day, which is why in my book, Energy Freedom, which is available on Amazon.com, in the closing chapter of my book, the title of that chapter is Stand Up, Show Up, Speak Up, which is about what can we do, how can we have an impact. And one of the things I recommend in there is that because there's so much going on and, and people, you can't, focus on everything. I mean, I spend all my time focusing on energy issues. I can't address any much else because I'm so focused on that. But what people need to do, your listeners, citizens, people who care about America, they need to find some organizations that they can trust, and obviously I believe mine is one of those, Energy Makes America Great Inc., found at energymakesamericagreat.org. And you need to find some organizations who who you can trust, who that generally have your uh, viewpoint, such as say Americans for Tax Reform is 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 a good one. And and there's whatever issues are important to you, you need to find those organizations with whom you can align, and then follow them, read their blog, read their tweets, and especially sign up for their email list, so that when there is an important issue, for example, we need to call Congress and say you know, don't vote for this or do the vote for this, that you can trust that organization's uh, action alert and respond accordingly because there's just so much going on that it's very difficult for the average person to track all the issues themselves that interest them. Marita, I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's you're spot on. First, there's this irony about social media. A lot of people think it's great because it gives them so much new information, but it, to a large extent, particularly Facebook and Twitter, are tools that many people use to great effectiveness to simply exaggerate the headline effect, right, where forget the substance. It, it's like naming the health care bill. Who wouldn't vote for something that sounds like that, right? And yeah. energy... And energy issues are among the worst with people not understanding it. As an energy expert myself, I understand it's an extraordinary. The the electric grid, for example, it's one of the most complex machines in the world. Many of the people in the industry only understand a certain segment, like generation or transmission or, or, or fossil fuel extraction, et cetera. And you can't be experts, and you do need to rely on organizations like yourself. 
I wanted to go back to the issue that you were basically raising on on trust. One of the challenges that I have here, and climate change I think is a perfect reference example of this, is that so much of the research that I've even seen personally is what I would refer to as outcome-based research, meaning the organizations or the people behind the funding are supporting people doing the research who are pretty much expected to produce a certain set of uh, outcome-oriented results. And I don't know how we really get around that. It, it's, it's very frustrating because that's what people base these false facts on. And, and you're right about that. And there is, there is definitely that element out there, and there are – um, you know, you can find, as most people know, you can find data that fits almost any viewpoint that you want it to fit. And that's why I particularly like this report that uh, Senator Ritter's office put out, the one we mentioned earlier, on um, the, the critical thinking. Because in the climate change issue, we've had 40 years of conversation, public conversation, science, research on this issue. And so with that that history, we, sh we should be able to, you know, regardless of which side you stand on, you should be able to look at the predictions and say, see clearly that they're wrong. So whatever science, you know, that outcome-based research, as you mentioned, whatever science said it was going to be this way, this way, or this way, we can now look back after four years and say, you know what, that was wrong. You all were wrong, and therefore... Um, you know, we, we should not be basing extensive public policy based on this research that has now been proven to be incorrect. And, uh, you know, there is there definitely is some of that, um, you know, outcome-based research that goes on. But with climate change in particular, we have the, the history. And also, for example, on the topic of fracking, we have um, the science has come out saying on both sides, the EPA, which has a, a vested interest in having fracking be proven to be bad, just last week um, there a new study came out. It was a federal study that showed that fracking does not contaminate groundwater. And so when you look, when you've got both outcome-based research, perhaps research that's funded by the industry, and federal research, when we know the current um, agenda, the mindset in the administration at this point is against fracking, um, and you see that both sides have come out with the same kind of reports, then you have to look at that and say, there's got to be some validity to this. Uh, Marita, I, I regret to inform you that the prognosticators must be accurate. There, there certainly is climate change because it was sunny a few minutes ago when, you, when we started this call, and it's now <laughs> raining horribly, it's blowing terribly, and there's even thunder and lightning. So, ergo, climate change must be real. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we, you know, the fact of the matter is, let me be clear on this, I know you're having fun with that, but the climate does change. There is no question about that, and the globe, the planet – has been warming for hundreds of years. And so the climate does change, and we see that as, as Dr. Roy Spencer showed. One of the charts he showed in that hearing was the uh, Roman warming pe warm period, the medieval warm period, and the modern warm period. And they're all, you know, when you look at the chart, they're all pretty much the same type of warming. And so the question is not are we warming. The question is, for, is A, is man causing it? And B, is it significant? And um, his conclusion is that man probably has some impact on it, but the amount is not significant. And uh, a warmer planet is actually a healthier planet, is, as many experts have, have shown. Well, I think there's, there's two specific issues that I also have a big problem with here. One, and, and I think you did a good job in your analysis of speaking in a roundabout uh, way to this specific point, which is, who bears the cost of being wrong? It's very easy for people to want to shut down in entire industries like coal, which, which support, uh, in some cases, almost entire state economies, uh, yes. but, and, and, and suppress in some of these states, too, suppress the cost of energy that, if they, if they lose coal, will go through the roof in populations that simply don't have the financial wherewithal to cover that. So who bears the cost if they're wrong? And the second issue is 
we we have got to have some way of protecting what I would call infrastructure oriented business cycles like energy where you have 20 and, and 30 year cycles uh, for investment and write down versus uh, you know politicking which is basically lives in two four or six year cycles or in some cases you know what's on what's going to be on CNN next uh, you know next Sunday afternoon and th- those are two very major problems that aren't really addressed and and I think are are, are very uh, unfair because ultimately America America uh, of, of both sides of the aisle have to pick up the tab. Yes, and those, those uh, cyclical decisions made by politicians have drastically hurt our economy. Uh, when you think about the economic mess that, that the United States is in right now, we have, we have more than this, but we have three problems probably all of us could agree on, and one is we need more, more jobs and we need more good-paying jobs. We, have, we need more revenues to the federal coffers. We have federal budgetary issues that are problematic, and we have a huge trade deficit. All three of those problems could be solved or at least greatly helped by a pro-energy agenda that this administration is not putting forward. Yeah, I completely agree with that one. Anyway, Marita, I, I wanted to say this because I there was another piece that I thought was great in, in actually, from your line of questioning with, um, I, I'm going to get this name wrong with uh, Fergot Roth. Yes, it's a and, difficult name to get right. <laughs> but this really sticks out at me, and I think this this is a, a trend that we've been discussing on the program, and that is that the lowest fifth of the income distribution spend an average of 24% of their income on energy, compared to 10% of their income for the middle fifth and 4% for those in the top fifth. And I say this all the time. The decisions that a lot of these social programmers, and that's what I refer to as you know, an Obama type, they create these programs which actually raise significantly the cost for the very poor that they're supposed to claim to represent, and even the middle class, who are constantly you know, beat up because they, they, they always fall somewhere in the middle of things that benefit wealthier people or things that benefit the poor. They always seem to be somewhere left out. And I think that, you know, I, I went to fill up my gas this morning, and I just said, you know, it's only four or five years ago that this was half the price, if not less than half the price. And it's not even that many years before that that gas was a dollar a gallon or dollar twenty a gallon. And every time you do that and you spend an extra $40, $50 a tank, that has a significant impact on somebody's life or life in a, in a home. And it has a, 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 an enormous impact on the poor. Yeah, it most certainly does. And it's interesting to me that the Democrats in general are the ones who tout themselves as being the, the, the saviors of the poor. You have to, there, there is this kind of perception out there in the public between the two parties that the Republicans care about the business people and the wealthy and the Democrats care about the middle class and the little people. And that's the perception that, that they portray, the Democrats portray of the two parties. But when you look specifically at this issue of climate change, uh, Bernie Sanders, independent senator from, I, from uh, Vermont, he proclaimed, yes, yeah, saving the planet is going to be expensive. And, um, you know, they, 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 they don't ever address the economics of it. It was the Republicans who brought into the panel the economists, who you quoted, one of them, and they're the ones who are looking at the economic issues and how this, these policies are going to hurt the poor. And as we've seen, as we've talked about, the, the predictions, so many of them have proven to be false, that you, you have to question, is this worth ruining the American economy over it? And, of course, obviously I believe the, the answer is no, that we need to be making sure that the data is sound before we go forward, but but as uh, Diana Puget Roth said in the in to me on a phone call after the hearing, she said they are they aren't interested in the data because I asked her well, what kind of response did you get? Do you feel like anyone changed their mind? Were there any aha moments for any of them? And she basically said no, they they've made up their mind and they they aren't interested in facts. They want to put on a carbon tax, which Bernie Sanders stated several times that he has sponsored legislation for a carbon tax, and a carbon tax will do nothing to save the planet, but it will do a lot to give more power 
to the to uh, the politicians. Oh, that is such a key word, power. And, that, and it, Marita, you couldn't be more correct. It, it is all about power with these uh, people down in Washington, D.C. I actually, you know, I didn't used to believe in term limits, but the further we get into this experiment, the more I want them for at least members of Congress. Yes, I agree with you. They, they, we've got people that are so entrenched there. And all that matters to them is getting reelected, and that does right. not serve the country well. No, it doesn't. Well, Marita, uh, please uh, share with our listeners your website so they can follow you, and and wh- whatever you'd like to share, please go ahead. Uh, the website is energymakesamericagreat.org, and uh, my columns are posted every Saturday night at midnight or every Sunday morning at midnight, depending on your perspective, on townhall.com. <laughs> Great. Well, it's been uh, fabulous having you join us again. Uh, we have to do this sooner, not later. And uh, I wish you luck with um, all your endeavors here. And I will continue to read your columns each week. I appreciate it. I hope your listeners will become my friend on Facebook as you and I are. Well, we could push for that as well. And I'll finish <laughs> reading this report. <laughs> Great. You'll enjoy it. It's very interesting. Uh, I do. Anyway, thank you again, Marina. Thank Newt you so much. Townhall.com. Thank you very much. And again, you can find her on energymakesamericagreat.org.